All right, so today I'm going to be talking to you all about Eager, a machine learning model for finding beaver complexes in satellite and aerial imagery. Now, before we get started, Eager is actually an acronym. It stands for Earth Engine Automated Geospatial Element Recognition, which is a lot of words to say what this model is basically going to do, which is find things geospatially in images. But why do we even need a model to find beaver dams? Beavers themselves will go around the landscape and make relatively small individual changes. So they'll chew down individual trees, they'll drag them around, but then they take those trees and they put them all together to make much larger changes through the construction of dams, lodges, canals. A single beaver dam like the one shown here can be over 100 meters long and can store enormous amounts of water behind them. And beavers don't usually build just a single dam or a single pond, they'll build many. And so it doesn't take a whole lot of beavers to completely re-engineer an entire valley bottom. This fundamentally is going to change the way that water and sediment moves through the system, which has a lot of impacts when you think about how these landscapes respond to climate change. As we have increasingly intense events like droughts and wildfires, more and more research is showing that these beaver complexes are uniquely resilient to those disturbances. They resist burning during fire. They keep plants lush during drought. They attenuate flood waves during really intense rain events. And that's of a lot of interest to us. But in order to figure out where beavers are having this kind of an effect or where they could have this kind of effect, first, we actually need to know where the beavers are to start with. And that's challenging. So when you look for beaver dams in satellite and aerial imagery, they are visible from pretty high up above, and that's great. But they all look a little bit different from one another. Some of them are clustered very tightly together. Some of them are all in sequence. Some of them are sort of staggered side to side. Sometimes you have a very large pond surrounded by much, much smaller ponds. Sometimes it's sort of this complicated web where the ponds are connected by canals and the color of the pond, depending on the image, it could show up quite dark. It could show up sort of bluish like that bottom image. And this is tricky because when I'm going through a landscape looking for the beaver dams, I'm never exactly sure what kind I'm looking for. And if I'm trying to train someone to do that, I have to tell them, you know, it could look like almost anything. <laughs> they have all sorts of different sizes and shapes and settings. Uh, and so it's very time consuming, which is why me and my collaborators thought, well, what if we could take a machine learning model to expedite this step of finding the beaver dams? And that was sort of the impetus for building the eager model. This machine learning model, we knew that we wanted it to be able to work at scale. So to ingest a lot of data and then think broadly. So we wanted the model to be able to go beyond the exact data it was trained on and find this huge variety of beaver dam shapes that we see out in the natural world. We considered both very simple pixel-based methods because they're easy to work with and easy to write, uh, and then also convolutional neural networks, which are a little more complicated and I'll get back to that in just a second. We also knew that we wanted to use input rasters or input data that made physical sense and that aligned with how we were already looking for beaver dams with our own eyes. So we used high resolution RGB or optical imagery, just like pictures that you can look at very high resolution. And then we also gave it a high res DEM or digital elevation model. So it could start to learn sort of the ups and downs of the landscape as we can intuit them from looking at a picture. And then finally, we had to give it a lot of training data. This was going to be about 10,000 plus beaver dams, and then also 50,000 plus not beaver dams. You can't just train a model based on what is what you're looking for. You also have to teach it what is not what you're looking for. People are really good at image recognition. This is one of our great skills. We can see one image, like this beaver here, and then very quickly understand that all of these other things that we're looking at are also beavers. Even though one's cartoonish, even though they're different colors, even though they're in different positions, we see one beaver and we can extrapolate what it might look like from different angles and perspectives. In very simple pixel-based machine learning models, you can train them that this image here is a beaver, but if you show it that beaver just a little bit tilted, it has a hard time with it. And it's like, hold on, wait a minute, I'm not sure. And that's because these most simple models, the most lightweight models we could have, they're really just learning the positions of the pixels in the image. And as soon as you rotate that or distort it, it starts to make the model less confident in what it's looking at. A convolutional neural network, on the other hand, is a style of machine learning model that scans over the image in chunks. It's not pixel by pixel by pixel. It's sort of areas of pixels. 
And as it scans across that image, it's looking at the red, the green, the blue, any other input files you give it, and not only learning where individual pixels tend to be located, but also what kinds of settings they're located in. So are the greenish pixels usually next to the reddish pixels or next to the bluish pixels? Are they usually in steeper parts of the landscape or flatter parts of the landscape? When we feed our model the RGB imagery that we're looking at, so these sort of beamed down images of Earth at very high resolution, and then we give it those digital elevation models, what it can ultimately learn from that is the sort of textures and the objects in an image. It's looking for the sort of pieces of the beaver dam in the pond, not just rigid structures and shapes. We also had to train it, so that took a lot of training data. Um, we'd go through landscapes and hand map all of these beaver dams and then extract them into patches that were about 25 by 25 meters and at about 0.2 meter pixel resolution, so very high resolution patches. And then we'd also rotate those images just to ensure that the model didn't accidentally learn orientations or north, south, east, west, and think that that was an important part of the shape of beaver dams. To teach it what was not a beaver dam, we basically took every positive training, uh, training points, every point where there was a beaver dam, and that's shown here in green, and then drew a donut around it, shown in yellow, and then anything within that donut was considered not beaver dam. And so the model could go in and sample from that area According to our sampling scheme, we told it to make sure you get X from the valley bottoms, X from the hill slopes, and so on. Um, to do this, it meant that we did have to thoroughly map our landscapes, though. We couldn't just find a handful of beaver dams and call it good. We'd draw a pretty big polygon, hand map everything within it, so that we could be confident that if it was not in one of these actual positive points, those little donuts around them were a safe bet to not contain real beaver dams. Our training data is shown here highlighted uh, with that greenish shading. So we took training data from Idaho and Colorado very heavily, and then a few more patches around the American West. In total, we used a little bit over 13,000 actual beaver dam locations. And then we found about 57,000 absence or pseudo absence. So known places without beavers or places where we did that donut sampling structure to assume there were no beavers for our negative data. We also evaluated the model in 12 different regions. Some were located within our training areas, um, not to say they overlap the training data specifically. It would just be like if there was a watershed and we'd mapped out this portion on the left, um, then the portion on the right that maybe had been unmapped was where we were going to test the model. So it was looking at similar landscapes. We also checked it outside of our training regions, and that was to see how good the model was at really extrapolating pretty far beyond what it had seen before. So the big question, could it actually find the beaver dams? Uh, so we give it a landscape like this, and we say, model, I want you to find all the beaver dams. First thing I do is go through and find them myself. And so I've highlighted them in white here for you. Quite a few beaver dams in this landscape. I wanted to see if the model could find them all and not be distracted by the other interesting things going on here. And it turns out it could. Uh, so shaded in let's light blue color now, that's the model's predictions for where the beaver dams were in this landscape. As you can see, it did find most of them pretty well uh, without a huge amount of error. When we evaluated how good the model was, um, accuracy was always super high. It was pretty much over 95% for everything. But a caveat to that is that beaver dams are a fairly rare landscape feature. There's not a ton of them in an area. So if you give it a large uh, sort of search area, even if the model went through and said, none of this is beaver dams, it would still be like 80, 85% correct, even if there were beaver dams in that image. So accuracy alone was not a good assessment. Instead, we looked at recall which is how much or how many of the actual beaver dams was the model able to find, and precision. So how much of what it thought was beaver dams was actually beaver dams. We favored recall over precision. We wanted to have it find the majority of beaver dams in the landscape without just pinging everything as beaver dam, because it was very quick for us to go through afterwards and quality control that data, flag things as yes or no, and move on from there. We have a prediction threshold, so that's the model's confidence in its predictions. Um, and you can adjust that to either favor recall or precision a little bit more or a little bit less. The model didn't always work perfectly. It did make some mistakes sometimes. It found false negatives, so it would only find uh, parts of beaver dams and ignore other parts of them. That was a mistake it was making, labeling things as not dam when they should have been labeled as dam. It also got really fascinated with cul-de-sacs, um, the edges of retention ponds, and some rivers that had small beaver dams on them, but then it thought the whole thing was beaver dammed. These were false positives that were easy to remove during QA and QC, 
but we'd like to continue working on the model so that it just doesn't find those areas. Unsurprisingly, it performed a lot better when it had seen similar beaver dams before. When we were pretty far outside of our training regions, um, our recall and precision both dropped significantly. So improving that would take adding more training data to let the model be aware of what a larger variety of uh, beaver dams actually looks like. So in summary, this model, even though it has room to improve, was very useful in the moment. Um, it's scalable. We can run it over thousands of square kilometers pretty quickly. It takes about a minute to search six square kilometers. So a whole county in the American West is gonna be about six to 12 hours of computing time, which is very fast compared to hand mapping. Uh, and it's cheap. It was only about 100 to $1,500 per county in computing costs, which is cheaper than paying a lot of hand mappers to do it. We'd like to improve that recall and precision primarily by getting more training data and maybe adding a SWIR layer into our uh, training data sets and our input rasters. We want to try tracking changes over time to see if the model is sensitive enough to pick up on the construction of beaver dams or removal of beaver dams from landscapes. This has applications in restoration, conservation, and range expansion of beavers. And then finally, we do want to quantify the total area that's been influenced by beavers. It is a big unknown even today. So I don't have a lot of time for questions at the end of this recorded talk, but I'm happy to talk in the discussion section uh, of this session. You can also email me, find me on Twitter, at least for now, uh, contact the whole team, if you want to see more results, go ahead and follow this link at the bottom of the slide, bit.ly slash eager, all capitals. And then you can see all of our results in an interactive sort of slider format. If you're looking on your phone, turn it sideways. It doesn't look very good in the vertical orientation. So thank you for listening, and I hope to get your questions later.